All right, so um, if you open up your Bibles to John chapter uh, 21, and those of you who are joining us uh, later on in the week uh, via YouTube channel, uh, NBCC, Norco YouTube, uh, we thank you for joining in on us. But um, we're going to look tonight, and if you have the outlines that I give to you, if, you, if it's your first time here, there's always outlines at the little table on, when you come to the doors over in there, but... I just want to begin with a thought because we're going to look at the restoration of Peter, and that's going to swing back around at the very, near the end of the message, but um, how many of you know that uh, failure of any, of any kind, any type, is really hard to come back from? It, it can really knock you for a loop. Has anybody ever experienced that before? I mean, it, it can get you. And uh, we all know, I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know right now, but we know that Peter... Um, he has told Jesus that night as they're walking from that Last Supper all the way up to the Garden of Gethsemane, he told Jesus that I, I'm never going to deny you. Even though Jesus said, you're all going to fall away this night. He goes, not me. I'm never going to deny you. And even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And, uh, and so he's made this massive proclamation that there's just no way he's going to turn his back on Jesus Christ. And we know that he does. Because here's the thing about our lives. We always think a little bit more highly of ourselves than we really should, right? You know, but when the rubber meets the road, when it's in crisis, that's when we find out what's really, what we're really all about, what we're capable of. And that's what Peter found out, and that's why there'll be a restoration later. Now, what you find in the Gospels is, as, is that when the resurrection takes place, and the women are the first ones to come to the tomb. They're the first eyewitnesses. They're the first evangelists, which by now you should know that is one of your key evidences for the reality of the resurrection because um, you would never in that day make the women what? The witnesses. Because in that culture, um, women's witness was considered untrustworthy. And so, um, and ev all four Gospels have the women as the first evangelists, and each Gospel was written in a different part of the Mediterranean. They didn't confer with each other. But you would never put that in there if you're trying to convince people in that day and age. But they did because it was true. And that's one of the evidences that this really did happen. Now, when they um, are at the tomb, and John and Peter come, and then they leave, in Mark, we find that Jesus, one of the things he tells the women is, he says, tell the disciples to meet me in Galilee, and then he, Jesus tells her, especially Peter, make sure you tell Peter. Now, if you're Peter, think about that when they come and they say, hey guys, uh, Jesus told us he wants you all to meet him at the Sea of Galilee, and then, they, oh, and you, Peter, he specifically said he wants to see you. And if you're Peter, what are you going to think in that moment right there? Oh, oh, oh no. Are you, he, no, he didn't. Yeah, he said, you, mm, 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 you know, he said your name. And so you, if, you, if you're Peter, you're thinking, oh, my gosh, you're probably feeling like panicked and terrified. And I let him down. And now he wants to see me in Galilee. And you probably think there'll never be another opportunity for, for, for me to ever, ever be able to serve him because it's really hard to come back from failure, is it not? And yet we're going to see tonight where he's going to be reconciled or re reconciled and restored back to Jesus Christ. It's going to be this, this uh, event in, in his life. So we're in John 21. We're going to cover the whole chapter tonight so we can finish and we can get to Daniel next week and begin that book. So chapter 21, 1 through 3 says this. After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, because Didymus means what again? Do you remember? It means twin. That's right. He more than likely was a twin. And Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee. Who are the sons of Zebedee? James and, and John. That's right. Boanerges. And two others of his disciples were together. Verse 3, Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will also come with you. So now they've gone back to Galilee area. We will also come with you. They went out, got into the boat. That night they caught, how much did they catch? They caught nothing. Now, when you read in uh, verse 1, 
that there at the Sea of Tiberias, just for information wise, Tiberias, Sea of Tiberias, it's just another name for the Sea of Galilee. It's the same thing. Tiberias is a, and it still is, there's a city called Tiberias on the western side, west-north side of the Sea of Galilee right there. So there's about seven disciples that we see mentioned right here. Now, bullet point, first bullet point in your notes, if you're taking notes, that is after a failure, we tend to go back to what is familiar. Do we not? Yeah. Um, Peter announces that now he's going to do what? I'm going to go back to fishing again. It, how many of you ever noticed about your life? You just really can't stay in limbo long. You got to get something going right away. You ever notice that about your life? You just, you, human beings are just like that. So Peter announces, I'm going to go back to fishing. What was his occupation before he began following Jesus? He was a fisherman. So he's, in a sense, you could kind of assume that I'm going to go back to my old way of life. And you find other disciples go with him fishing. So you're always leading someone somewhere, no matter if it's the right thing or the wrong thing. Always remember that. Somebody's watching, somebody's following. But he goes back to fishing. What does he catch? He catches nothing. Because you really can't go back and go back to what it was before. The nets are empty. And every time you try to go back as a follower of Christ to some old way, how many know it just comes up empty? Any amens on that? It just doesn't have it anymore. It doesn't work anymore. And why doesn't that, and why... Why doesn't it work for these guys? Because they're to catch men, not fish. Remember? That's going to be the thing now. They're not supposed to catch fish. They're going to catch men. Now, look at verse 3 in your Bibles there. What time of the day, what was the, uh, what, what time, yeah, when do they fish? At night. night, that's right. Now, and they would fish at night. They would go out at night. And they would bring in the morning as they came back to shore, they would bring their catch and they would sell their catch in the morning. Now, <clears throat> um, so it's, it's, they, they've come in the morning now, they fish at night, you can see the time frame. This becomes very important later on in, in tonight's teaching. Now verse 4, it says, but when the day was now breaking, so it's between night, and dark and light, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Now, a couple of things. First off, they don't know it's Jesus because it's between dark and, and light. There's another reason, and I'll give it to you a few verses later. But here's the thing I want to point out to you. I, I think it's just fascinating. I like to look at surroundings like that. It's between dark and light. Where is Peter in his life right now? He's between dark and light. That's exactly where he's at. And I think it's a really good imagery of Peter's life because... Uh, we, we know from, uh, I believe it's Luke, writes that um, Jesus even told Peter that Satan wanted to sift him. But then he would turn, and he says, I prayed for you, Peter. So it's going to be this rough thing. And he's between dark and he's between light right now. I think the imagery is really cool. Now, verse 5, it says, So Jesus said to them, Children, you do not have any fish, do you? And they answered? They answered, No, we don't. He says, You caught anything? And what do they have to admit? No, we're a bunch of failures right here. We're professional fishermen, and we've caught nothing whatsoever. What does he call them? Children. children. Isn't that interesting? He calls them children. Now, the Greek word uses here means a small child. And it means literally an undeveloped understanding. And it's in the plural in the Greek. So he's calling all of them kids with an undeveloped understanding. They're not getting it. They're not understanding what is all going on yet. So he's talking to them. Verse 6. And he said to them, now here he comes, cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch. So they cast, and, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Whoa. Now, bullet point, second one in your notes is this. One change can change everything. Can it not? One change can change everything. Now, I'm going to ask you some questions, some thoughts that I think Jesus could kind of be suggesting here. Um, <clears throat> how big of a change is Jesus suggesting feet-wise? The boat's not real wide, guys. Maybe 12 feet? Yeah, Take it this side, left side, cast it on that side. That's a real small change, right? 
And that real small change is going to lead to some really good results, huh? And sometimes all it takes with what we're doing is some small little change, correct? Some little tweak, some little thing we got to do in our life, and it's going to lead to some really, really good things. Now, <clears throat> what time of the day is it now that he is telling them, cast your net on the right side? It's morning, so the sun's out now, right? Somewhere in there. Question, do they fish in the daytime or at nighttime? They fish at nighttime. So for them now to fish in the daytime, that's kind of a big deal, right? That's a big change. And sometimes when it comes to change, we need to make bigger changes in our life or in our situation or what we're doing for us to incur maybe the success that we want to uh, get in our life. Correct? You follow me so far? Okay. Let me tell you something. For, for what it's worth to whoever here, failure's not the end. Right? Look, you guys have the luxury over the years, if you've been here, of watching me try a lot of things and seeing me fail on some stuff, attempts. Any amens? Good, you didn't say amen. <laughs> no, but here's my, here's my deal. I try different methods. I try to tweak methods here and there, but I never change the message. I never do that. And I've tried different things, different outreaches, different this. Many have worked. Some fell flat on their face. And, but, I'll, but I'll keep trying different things as I as feel the Holy Spirit's push me to do those things. So I know that my motive is reach lost people and disciple Christians. That's my motive. But my method that I try, sometimes it works and sometimes it, it just doesn't work. But you've got to understand in your life that... Uh, the methodology has to change, right? That's why they tell you, write the vision down with pencil so you can erase it at times and switch it up. But the message never, ever changes at all. You think about right now the day we're living in. Why is there a camera here? Why are we doing this? Because churches had to, and especially when COVID began, oh my gosh, how many churches were caught off guard when COVID hit as far as trying to reach their people via social media online, right? I mean, how many churches were not ready for those things? Uh, I thank God we have a lot of young staff. We're ready. We had the cameras. We had the online presence. We had everything. And it was just like, boom. Those guys just switched in a matter of minutes, man. They were able to put things together, and it, it flowed great. But that was a change, a methodology that we had to put in place years before, and some churches didn't do that, and some churches lost out because of, you know, because they shut everything down. But here, here's the deal. The methodology, you've got to think of the methodology in your life at times. It's going to change, and it's got to change. It's got to move forward. You all know, I, I think I said it a couple Sundays ago. Anybody remember Zodis? Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, we were talking about White Front. Yes. Yeah, remember those? Treasury. Which one? Treasury, I'm too young. I don't remember that. No, I'm just joking. I remember Treasury. I'm joking. Mervyn's, remember all those places? Yeah? Okay. Uh, which one? Jemco. I remember going to Jemco. I remember reading about Jemco in the National Archives in the library. No, I'm joking. I went with my mom to Jemco. I remember we, there was a, a Fedco. They, we had to have a card, right? Remember to get in there? Stuff like that. Now, those aren't around anymore. Blockbuster. Remember Blockbuster? Yes. There's still, I think there's still one. The last one, if it's still open, in Bend, Oregon. It's the last one. There are no more blockbusters after that. Now, so Olivia and I want to watch a movie Friday nights. We drive to Bend to get it. No, we don't drive it. But, but, he, but here's the thing. All these businesses, you know, you go to Tyler Mall Gallery. There's no more Broadway in, in there, is there? It's gone, man. They, some of these stores, they did not change the methodology with the times. And because they didn't keep up, they lost. Because some people just get really stubborn. No, it's going to keep working. No, it doesn't always work. Things just change. And things move forward. And you've got to remember that even in, in Christian circles, you've got to think that way. And if you failed, if you tried things, it's okay. Now you know what doesn't work, right? And now you don't try that anymore. Now, let's move on. Um, verse 7 and verse 8. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, who is that? John. John he's, you've got, he's not going to say, oh, it's me, guys. No, he just, it's, it's, it's John. Said to Peter, it is the Lord. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, 
He put on his outer, he put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. Verse 8. But the other disciples came in the, in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, but about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of, full of fish. Now, when it says he was stripped for work, he's not naked, okay? Just get that out of your mind. It means he's taken off his outer coat. He's got his tunic on. They would pull the dress up, tuck it in the belt like that so they could maneuver and they could walk easily. Then when they were off the boat, they would take the skirt back out, drop it down. He takes that out. He puts his outer coat back on and he dives into the water is what's going on in this particular uh, situation right here. Now, how far away from land is that boat? About 100 yards. Now there's another reason why they probably didn't recognize Jesus because they're 100 yards away from the land between dark and light. So that, that might be another reason why they don't know it's him. <clears throat> so, verse 9. So when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire and are already laid and fish placed on it and bread. Now, let me give you two bullets here. Here's the first one. Two truths. No matter how successful we become, God is bigger than our success. Would you agree with that? Amen. Are they bringing in a massive load of fish? Yes. Are they successful? Yes. You better believe it. Question, does Jesus already have fish? Yes. Does he have some bread with him? Yes. Yeah, you better believe it. And he's going to feed these guys. They're going to get there with all their catch of fish, and Jesus already has fish, and he's got bread. That's interesting to me. Is it interesting to you? Because all the success in the world, and they got, they got a lot, it's going to be 153 fish. That's a big load. They're bringing all this success here, and Jesus has bread and fish, and he's going to feed them the bread. Now, we know man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, right? And Jesus is the bread of life that came down from heaven. So no matter how much I accumulate, how much success I have, I still need to have Jesus feed me the things that make for what satisfies in my soul and my life and my etc amen yeah so you got to think like that some of us who are older now we've accumulated some things and you know you know this from experience that even though you buy something new and it really gives you a good feel for about 12 hours right <laughs> but then it wears off because it's an inanimate object there's no life in it it's cool to have but it's not going to give you life only jesus can satisfy your life amen to that one now, let's drill down deeper. The second bullet point is this. Jesus will recreate to restore Peter. He will recreate to restore Peter. I love what we just read, and let me tell you why. What time of the day is it again? Morning. From, it's right there between dark and light. What kind of fire did Jesus make? Charcoal. Kind of fire was Peter around the fire when he denied Jesus? Charcoal. What time of the day was it? Right at the end of dark, heading towards light. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting that he's recreating the situation? It's almost like you expect Rod Serling to walk out in Twilight Zone, huh? <laughs> but he recreates the whole situation. Can you imagine when Peter gets there and his charcoal fire and the whole between towards dark, towards light, and Jesus is there, that would be a very eerie feeling. What's going on here? And why is this going on? I don't think it's a coincidence. I don't think anything in Scripture is a coincidence. There's a reason behind this. It's, it's like Jesus is setting these things up to take Peter back, because remember, Peter has to be restored, does he not? Yes. So he's taking him back to a situation where he denied Jesus. It's the same feel. It's the same look. It's the same all this stuff. It's the same. You see, here's what I've found that the Holy Spirit does. And, and, you, and most of you know, my, if you're new, you don't know my story, except you maybe you've heard little bits here and there, but most of you know when I did that series last year, I told you it all. I told you all the junk and all the dysfunction I came out of. I told you all the things that I went through and all the pain and all the mess-ups that from growing up in an alcoholic's home and everything like that. Um, but I find the Holy Spirit takes me back 
to move me forward. See, he's taking Peter back. He's recreating the situation. But he's not taking him back to play a victim or to get mad at somebody or to blame mom or to blame dad. Or do, he's not doing that. He's taking him back to move him forward. That's what he's doing. And I found the Holy Spirit, if we've got the guts, he will have us take a hard, hard look at ourselves to connect the dots of why do I act the way I do? Why am I this way in relationships? Why do I react, respond in these situations this way? Why am I stuck in this pattern? Why? If I look, if he, and then the Spirit of God takes me back, starts connecting dots, and I can start to see where within my family of origin, what I've learned, all these different things, this is why I act the way I do because I can see where these things began back here. Any amens? Amen. It, it, that, that's, that's where it comes. Now, let me just say, you guys all look like you want to grow, so this pertains to none of you, but I got to say it. Some, of, some people, periodically in my lifetime, when I've talked with them and shared these things, and they've come to me for counseling, it don't matter what I say, they will tell me this. How, there's nothing in my past that affects me today. If you take just that statement, then you must say all your Bible reading has no effect upon you whatsoever. Exactly. Right? Yep. You're kidding me. I thought, and you try to talk to No, I said, everything from your past has made you who you are today. Yeah. Everything. Everything. I mean, haven't some of you seen and observed now in your family of origin and maybe even seen, remember, grandparents or whatever, you've watched certain cycles in your family. Haven't you seen that? Yes. And, you, and you finally come to the point and say, this cycle's going to break with me. Yes. We're not doing this anymore. That was the alcoholism. I said, my kids will never grow up and have to know what alcohol looks like and an alcoholic dad looks like. They will never, ever see alcohol in my home. They'll never see this. I, I will never put my children to this, and I will never give them the excuse to drink alcohol because of my life. It's not going to happen because I grew up in this stuff, and I know the damage that it does over your life and through decades of overcoming and overcoming and overcoming. And so what happens? Here comes the Spirit of God. Here's Jesus with Peter. I'm going to take you back in time. We're going to recreate the situation. I'm going to connect the dots so I can free you and move you forward. Does that make sense? It's yes. exactly what he does. And he does it because he loves us. Not because he hates anybody. Not because, oh, I hate looking at the past. God will never have you look at the past to make you feel terrible or bad or poor me. I don't look at growing up in an alcoholic home like, oh, my poor me, why did I? I don't do that at all. I don't do that at all. Because that's a waste of time. That's not going to heal me. It's not going to do anything in my life. I want to change. I want to grow. I want to be like what God wants me to be. So does that make sense? Yes. So he's going to do that at times. He's going to take us around the charcoal fire between dark and light and say, okay, we're going to deal with some stuff. And those, those are seasons of life. Now, verse 10. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Hmm. In other words, Peter, bring me some of that fish and uh, come join me and we're going to take some of your success. Uh, isn't it great that, Peter, you get to taste some of your success and I'm going to hang out with you and I made that success happen and we get to share it together? Isn't that pretty cool? I just like that little thing right there. Now, verse 11. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of large fish, 153. Although there were so many, and the net was not what? That was not torn. Now, let me give you some things here. The first thing is this. Is 153 fish a lot? For them to say, and the net was not torn, insinuates that typically the net would what? Tear. tear. But it's not tearing because Jesus got this whole thing going on with these guys right here. So, the first thing I'll tell you is this. Did they expect that many fish? Probably not. So always remember that Jesus gives us a bigger mission than we can handle. He's going to do it. If you trust him, if you step out, it's that, that quote I read years ago and I've shared it with you multiple times. And it's like, it just made so much sense to me when I, when I read this. Is that it was, it's this. If what the Holy Spirit tells you to do is boring, bland, or predictable, Probably not the Holy Spirit. 
It's probably not the Holy Spirit. He's not going to tell you to do something that's boring, bland, or predictable. He's going to have you step out in faith and take big steps. Amen? Amen. Now, let me give you a second thought out of here. Do you remember the first time, it's back in Luke chapter 5, when Jesus um, gets in the boat with Peter, goes out in the deep water, and they catch a bunch of fish? Remember that one? Do you remember they didn't count the fish up? But now they count the fish up. But back then, they didn't count any fish. But now they count 153 fish. Now, that's interesting, too, for two reasons. Here's the first one. The first one is that in that day, they believed in that region that there were 153 species of fish in the Sea of Galilee. Isn't that something? And so when you think about that, and if they're now not to catch fish but to catch men, it's almost like he's saying, you're to catch the whole world. You're going to go into the whole world and catch every ethnicity and every group. You're to go after everybody. It's almost like he's sending the message. But here's who it gets even better than that. 153 fish. The number 153, if they're counting it up in the Hebrew way of counting, because you can convert these to letters and to statements, it, it's called uh, gematria. And it means this. 153 means, I am the Lord thy God. Wow. Can you imagine? That's incredible right there. What's going on here? Now, verse 12. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. I wouldn't ask him either. Verse 13. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the the dead. Now, they sit to eat. He gives them fish and he gives them bread. Now, has that ever happened before on the shores of Galilee or near Galilee? Yes. The multiplication of the fish and the loaves, right? So now there's another recreation going on right here. But here's my big question. Where do you get bread? Where do you get bread at? You ever think of these little things right there? I mean, the only, and I can't prove it, but since he's manifested there, which means the invisible becomes visible, Maybe he just created the bread. And maybe he just manifested, created the 153 fish in the net. Because can't he do that? He's the creator. He can do whatever he wants to do. I think, I think it's highly possible. Now, <clears throat> now Jesus has Peter right where he wants him. And now he's going to perform the surgery that he performs on us periodically. So let's read verse 15, 16, 17, and then we'll go back and I'm going to show you some things that are fascinating. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, aren't you just glad that Jesus lets us finish eating before he just puts the knife in? (laughs) Thank you, Jesus, for that. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He just called out Peter. Do you love me more than these? He said to him, Peter says to Jesus, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my lambs. Verse 16. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And by the way, he's not calling him Peter, is he? He had changed his name to Peter. That's interesting, huh? He said to him, he said, do you love me? He said to him, "Uh, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. Verse 17. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because it's getting heavy now because Jesus keeps asking him. He's grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? He said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Okay. Notice first, my sheep, I'm sorry, my lambs, my sheep, my sheep. Who does the church belong to? It's Jesus. We're his sheep. It doesn't belong to any pastor. I'm just an under shepherd. I'm just doing what he tells me to do. 
It's all his, but we're all his sheep. The second thing I want you to notice is this. Some of you know this, but there are different words for love used in the Greek language. How many of you know that, right? Okay. Let me, let me give you what four of them are. Eros is romantic love. It's sexual love. You have phileo, which is friendship, Philadelphia, but it's friendship love. Then you have storge, which is family, familial love. Then you have agape, which is God's love. It's like a love feast. It's choosing the highest good for other people. It's that. Now, just sidebar quickly. This is the problem in the world sexually. If you eliminate God's agape love, choosing the highest good for somebody else, if you take that out of the way, then you can interpret eros, romantic sexual love, any way you want. Any amens? See, the moment you eliminate God and agape, you can reinterpret everything any way you want, and that's the problem in our culture, in the world, sexually. That's why there's no holds barred, there's no boundaries, it's perversion, it's all over the place. Because they've eliminated God, therefore they've eliminated agape love. Now watch this. In verse 16, Jesus asked Peter, do you agape me? That's God's love, right? Peter answers, I phileo you. We're friends. In verse 17, Jesus asks him again, Peter, do you agape me? Peter answers, I phileo you. I'm your friend. Then in verse 17, Jesus changes it, and he shifts it, and he says, okay. And he asks Peter this time, Peter, do you phileo me? And Peter says, yes, I phileo you. That's really interesting in the change in the Greek words and how Jesus brings it down to where Peter's stuck at. Isn't that? But why does Peter answer phileo instead of agape? First off, Maybe it's because Peter, and it's a good thing, he's not so arrogant anymore. He's not like, I'm never going to fail you, and I'm never going to do this, and I'll die. He's not that guy anymore. He knows I can fail as much as the next person. I'm not going to try to be some arrogant, boastful guy like I'm going to get God's love down perfect. I'm not going to do that. And Jesus is not slamming him when he says on the third time, do you phileo me? I like the fact that he tries to meet Peter right where he's at. Because that's where Peter's at right now. And it makes perfect sense to me that he's he's restoring this guy. It's like, I'm going to get you right where you're at and bring you along very slowly because Peter, you're going to change the world. You're going to be this person that on the day of Pentecost, you're going to preach, man, and people are going to get saved, Peter. Now, let's move on. Verse 18. Let's drive it home. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Verse 19. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. When he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Bullet point. Next one. Peter will die a martyr's death as an old man. Peter will die a martyr's death as an old man. So Jesus tells him, Peter, when you're young, you can do what you want to do, go where you want to go, like the old song, right? But when you're older, they're going to gird you. And the word gird means to fasten. And wasn't Peter, historically, wasn't he fastened to a cross, crucified upside down? When you're old, they're going to take you and they're going going to kill you. It's, It's just going to happen. Now, watch this. Watch what happens. Verse 21. And 20, verse 20 to 22. Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. Who's that disciple again? That's John now. Following them. So can you imagine? Here's Peter and Jesus walking on the shore of Galilee, maybe, and John is walking behind them, trying to hear what's going on. <laughs> Following them, the one who also had leaned back on his bosom at the supper and said, Lord, Who is it who betrays you? So Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, 
What about this man? See, he turned back to John now. He says, what about him? You told me how I'm going to die. What about him? I'm going to die a martyr's death. What about him? Verse 22. Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Okay. Peter hears, I'm going to die a martyr's death. And here, here's John. He goes, okay, how is he going to die? What's going to happen to him? And Jesus says, that's not your business. My will for him is my will for him, and my will for you is my will for you. How many times do we got caught up and say, Lord, how come they're not going through what I'm going through? How come they have that and I don't have that? You ever do that? I serve you just like anybody else. What about them? And Jesus would tell every one of us, don't worry about them. You worry about you. You worry about what I tell you to do, and that's all you got to worry about. Just do it. It's great advice. Now, verse 23. Therefore, this saying went out among the brethren <clears throat> that that disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only if I want him to remain until I come. What is that to you? Huh. Can you imagine that? That old, old John, the idea was that people took on this rumor that you know, he's not going to die. How many times do you think he had to squash that one? No, that's false doctrine. That's heresy. And John would spend his life going against false doctrine and heresy. He's teaching these things. But he probably had to squash that rumor all the time. Now, verse 24. This is the disciple who is testifying to these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And now John reaffirms what he's been saying throughout the whole thing. I'm an eyewitness to the resurrected Jesus Christ. Verse 25. Last verse, then we're going to cut across real quick. And, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written. Can you imagine? So, did Jesus do a lot more things than we read in the Gospels? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if they ever find any other things in that era of time that state these things, you always got to remember, he, it's always got to be coinciding with what's already written. What's already written. Never forget that. Now, here's where I want to finish the whole book. I want to go back to Peter. Go to Acts chapter 12. We covered this about eight chapters ago on Sunday, probably two second session ago. Go back to Peter. Now, what did Jesus tell Peter? That he would die what? How old would he be? Be an old man. Now, watch Acts chapter 12. Peter's out on the mission field. Verse 12, verse 3. When he saw that it pleased the Jews... This is right after they, they killed James, the first uh, martyr, first uh, of the apostles to be martyred, John's brother. When he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. When he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out before the people. So Peter was kept in the prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. On the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers because they would chain him to two soldiers as he slept. Bound with two chains and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. If you remember, when we cover this on a Sunday morning, Peter's going to die in the morning. He's going to be executed. If you were going to be executed in the morning, would you be able to sleep like he's sleeping? There's no way. But Peter's asleep. He's sleeping like a baby. Why can he sleep like a baby? You know why? Because he's humming that song, I'm still a young man. He's still young. And Jesus told him he's going to die an old man. So he knows that I can't die in the morning. I know I can't because Jesus told me I will die as an old man. Amen. Gospel of John done. 
We move to Daniel next time. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for the truths from your word that enable us to live for you. And now, God, as we leave this gospel and we move to the Old Testament uh, document of Daniel, I pray that we grow immensely through that one now. I thank you, Lord, for everybody here. I, I pray peace and joy in the homes of everyone here. Lord, give us opportunities tomorrow and the rest of this week to share faith and give us the boldness when those doors of opportunities open up. Let us step through them. Trusting, Lord, that it's not we who speak, but it's the spirit of our Father that speaks through us. Thank you, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray and we all said, amen. Amen.